Hi guys and welcome to the second week of the performing stage of the audit and now we move into the biggest part of the performing stage and the biggest scope of work we can do which is your substantive procedures. Okay, so we're going to spend two weeks dealing with substantive procedures because there is so much we can do that falls into the bracket of a substantive procedure. Before we get into the detail, let's go and have a look at your schedule so you can see the standards we are going to address and then at what level you are required to know the standard so you know where to focus and spend your time when you cover this topic. So we, in week two, we're doing a double lecture on substantive procedures. We are not going to be doing any questions at this point. I want you to get all the knowledge of substantive procedures before we start to test how you go and do them. Look at the standards we have to cover. 330, which we've already done, because that's your responding to risks. So your plan is going to say you need to do substantive procedures. Now you're going to physically do the ones or the procedures that you feel according to your audit plan. We're doing ISA 500, 501, 505, 510, 520, 530, 540, 580, 610 and 620. So in terms of the knowledge level that SACA requires you for each of those standards, let's have a look here. We've got your ISA 500 audit evidence. We've said we addressed it in week one. We are also addressing it in week two, and you can see it's a level three. We know that you need to understand audit evidence. Underneath that, now we look at the actual procedures, substantive analytical procedures being addressed in week two. It's a level three, as well as your test of details as a level three. So I need to spend a lot of time on these procedures. When we move down into the specific standards, I haven't highlighted here, but you should have it highlighted. ISA 501, specific considerations for selected items, it's a level two. And as we move down into external confirmations, ISA 505, it's a level three. I must make sure I spend enough time here. Initial audit engagements, opening balances, 510, it's a level three. 520 analytical procedures, it's a level 3. Audit sampling, 530 is a level 2. So I'm not going to spend as much time as I'm going to everywhere else. I say 540, counting estimates, a level 2. And that is what we are going to be addressing in terms of week 2. Then we come back to written representations, week 2. I say 580 is a level 3. And using the work of internal auditors 610 and the work of auditors experts 620 both of these addressed in week two are also level threes okay so that's all that's going to be addressed this week and they are level threes remember we've got two weeks for substantive procedures so the rest that need to be addressed in this schedule will be addressed next week so if we just do a quick recap of what we did last week, we said we needed to now consider if the client had a computer information system and how that affects the auditors in general. So what is the information system? Information system is how data, so data being a sale or a purchase, information that affects accounting records, how that data is initiated, processed and recorded in the information system. And we said we have done this from a manual perspective already. Now we're saying if this information system is a computer information system, what does that mean for the auditors and the audit? So before the client can start using this computer information system, their way of how they go about recording the transactions being computerized, 
they need to make sure that that computer information system is programmed correctly so that when they put in the information that says that they made a sale to someone, it goes and records the sale in the revenue journal. And the equal and opposite entry goes to the specific data. And you can see that this has to happen before they do make the sale and go and put it into the system. Because if they haven't programmed it correctly, when they put the sale into the system, it's not going to go to revenue. It's going to go to the wrong place. So before they start to use it and put the data in to go into the accounting records correctly, the accounting records must be programmed such that when that information comes in, it goes to revenue. When this purchase information goes in, it goes to your purchases. Okay, so before they use this, it must be set up correctly. What are the controls that they have to have in place here that ensure that they have programmed it correctly and that the data is protected? The general controls. So what do these do? They prevent loss of data, incorrect recording, changes of data. They prevent all of that. How do they prevent loss of data? Well, antivirus will prevent a virus from coming in and manipulating that data or wiping that data out. Backup will prevent losing the most up-to-date information or data in the system. The programming will make sure that the data goes to the right place when the data is eventually input, so it's not the incorrect recording of it. The access controls will make sure that somebody can't get in and change the data or steal and remove the data. So your general controls will be there to make sure when data comes in, it is recorded correctly and it's protected that it is not lost. Now that they've set it up correctly, so ultimately these are your setup controls. And they need to start using it, putting in the information to record the revenue in the revenue journal, putting in the information to record the creditor. They need to have controls to make sure that when this information goes in, it stays in. And that it doesn't get changed. And that when it gets in, that only the correct information is coming into the system. So people who are going into the system have the authority to do so and are putting in the correct information. These are the controls now for the operation of the system, for using the system for its intent, this computer information system. And these are the application controls. They are there to ensure that the data that goes in is complete, it's accurate, it's valid. And so when it goes into the accounting records, the journals, the general ledgers, the financial statements, it goes in correctly. What are those controls? So they are your controls like your access controls, your screen aids, your program checks, your logs and reports to show what has been input. They're your input, your processing, and your output controls. The input of the data, the information, because the system has already been set up appropriately. So, we looked at if the client started to use an information system. How does it affect the auditors? Well, we needed to understand the computer information system, and then, 
understanding that they've got a computer information system, we can go and test that. So if they use a computer information system, so here's a computer information system, versus here is a manual information system. If they use a computer information system, they will have control activities, such as application controls. And as an auditor, when I now need to go and perform my procedures, apply the audit plan, I can go and perform tests that will test the computer information system, test data, and I can also still do my manual tests. Okay, because there will still be manual controls if they have a computer information system. Where they have an information system that is purely manual, they will only have manual controls. And when I want to go and test the controls, I will go and perform manual tests of controls. So this was the first part of the performing stage of the audit process saying we can go and perform tests of controls if they have an information system that is computerized or manual and they have got controls in place. If there are no controls, I can't do tests of controls. If they have controls, we can now go and understand them and based on our understanding, decide if we want to test them. That's test of controls and controls finished. Now we are going to move on to the other type of testing we can do as auditors, which is substantive testing. Okay? And it's got nothing to do with controls. I'm not interested in the controls any longer. When I am an auditor and I want to do substantive testing, I want the information in the accounting records and I'm going to go and test that information on my own irrespective of the controls that they have in place. Okay. Before we get there guys, I mentioned this to you right in the beginning of auditing and I'm going to bring it back. I require you guys to write a lot during my lectures for the purpose of learning. When you write something yourself, you take it in more because you don't just hear it, you physically have to write it and see it for yourself. Often you'll have to write it in your own words, even if I've written it on the screen, you might not have the time or you might not be comfortable with what I've written, but you know what I'm saying, so you write it yourself. When you write, you are actively thinking about the words you are writing and then reading. So it's like a double whammy in learning. Okay, so this lecture and next week's lecture where we deal with substantive procedures, I'm going to get you writing. You are going to have to write what I write because I haven't put it in the slides because I don't want you to just study it off by heart and learn it. I want you to see what I'm writing, to see what I'm saying, to you write it yourself. So when you have to write this in a test or in a question, you've done it before. It's not the first time you have to come up and write a substantive procedure. You've written it before. It's your handwriting here. So studying it is going to be a lot easier as well because it's your handwriting. It's not just notes that I've made. So prepare yourself now for a lecture of a lot of writing. Make sure you know you're going to be doing that and get comfortable with it because I'm telling you there is more learning going on than just being frustrated at having to write a lot of things. Okay, so substantive procedures. I've said you have to do substantive testing for any material balance or class of transaction or disclosure. And you have to do substantive testing if there is a significant risk associated with a transaction, a class of transactions, an account balance or disclosure. We've seen all of this stuff before, guys. This we saw when we were looking at the audit plan. 
ISA 330 told us that we had to do substantive procedures for those. That's why when we decide we want to test controls, we will follow a combined approach because we would only be testing material, class of transactions, account balances and disclosures, which means we will have to do substantive along with those tests of controls. There are two types of substantive procedures. We've got our analytical review and our test of detail. If we go the combined approach, we're going to want to do more analytical and less test of detail. If we go a fully substantive approach, we're going to be doing more test of detail and less analytical because analytical are just reasonableness tests. They just say this does seem to be reasonable compared to prior the market, our expectation. Whereas the test of detail we're going to get into heavily today, we test the random amount, the date, the classification. Okay, so there's a lot more work involved in test of detail. So how are we going to approach substantive procedures? Well, first of all, guys, the beginning part of the lecture, we are going to look at those ISAs that we saw in the plan for the week that cover specific types of substantive procedures that must be performed or address specific balances that require substantive procedures to be performed. So we're going to look at the standards. Then we're going to list the general substantive procedures that need to be performed for a transaction, a class of transaction, an account balance or a journal. Those are the procedures that you should be putting down when you start doing substantive procedures. And guys, as we discuss a general procedure when we're looking at the standards, I will say this is a general procedure so that you can then make the reference to when we look at our list, ah, oh, that came from this standard. We have already done the standard. And then I'm going to give you examples of substantive procedures for each assertion. So remember, we've got assertions for class of transactions, which are therefore applicable to an individual transaction or a class, a group of them. And then we've got assertions for account balances. So we are going to now go and look at each assertion, understand what the risk is for that assertion, and then come up with a procedure that will address that risk. Granted, guys, that when you get into the detail of a very complex balance, there will be more procedures than what I've given you examples for. But these examples will help you to start thinking along the lines of what do you need to add when I get to a more complex balance, as opposed to not having a starting point at all. Okay, so let's start with our first standard, work through the standards, and then we'll get into the examples of general and procedures for assertions.